ومن قرعه سورة الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي قصرت عن رؤيته يبصار الناظرين وعجزت عن نعته يوهام الواصفين الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين وبالقاسم محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى وقوله الحق وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم واعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرقوا واذكروا نعمة الله عليكم إذ كنتم عادا فألف بين قلوبكم فأصبحتم بنعمته إخوانا صدق الله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The verse that I recited is from chapter 3 verse number 103 a very commonly recited verse Usually the purpose of recitation of this verse is to address the concept of unity. And inshallah, while we are discussing in these ayam, um, we will try and incorporate some of the messages that we derive from Ashura. And amongst those messages that we come across, and without having to even think about it, is that maybe throughout the year we might have our differences. But when it comes to commemoration of these majalis of Sayyidu Shuhada, we all come together. There's this attraction in it that brings everybody on the same page. Regardless of their backgrounds, regardless of their statuses, regardless of what they might be in their own little world. But whenever come, when you come to this Majlis Aza, there's no difference between one another. They're all equal because everybody here is commemorating his Ghamkhar of Sayyidu Shuhada. And that one aspect is something which unites us. And we should be looking for these such opportunities whenever we can to put our efforts together and to bring ourselves together and to let go of all the differences that might be. I know communities and societies within our Shia Madhab that within the families there's so many differences and the family members don't even want to see one another. But then when it comes to dealing with affairs of the world, and when this Majlis Aza is happening, 
we sit together. But when the majlis is over, then we go back to being the same way. When you come to these majlis, first of all, you're coming here to perform this ibadat. It's not a formality. There's nothing that you're giving to Sayyidu Shuhada by attending. If anything, you are learning something. Not from member even. If you're not learning of one thing from the member, at least by being in this presence, there's this spirituality that exists because of the gham that we are commemorating. So my plea would be from everyone. If there's someone in your life you are odds with, you, are, you have differences with, and you don't get along, that family member of yours, for the sake of Sayyidah Shuhada, for the sake of these majalis that you attend, some people come only for the 10 nights. Make sure that you're able to get rid of that hostility that exists, exists in your hearts. Make sure you're able to remove those differences that you have for the sake of Sayyidu Shuhada. Because if this majlis is not bringing any reform, what did Imam embark upon when he said that all I want to do is my purpose of this rise is what? To bring islah, to bring reform. Every single year, the month of Muharram begins. We commemorate the majalis, but we're still at odds with that family member of ours. So much so has been talked about, about Sile Rahim. That how important it is to connect the ties. And so much has been talked about in regards to qat rahim Disconnecting the ties with the family members. In fact, on three occasions in Quran, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about qat rahim qat rahim And one occasion, he curses, sends the la'anat upon the one who has disconnected the ties with their family members. So it is of utmost importance. If I can highlight this point a little bit more, that when our Prophet ascended to Miraj, he said, I saw on the door of paradise, there were three lines that were written. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. After the Recitation of Bismillah. The first line said, For Sadaqa, uh, 10 rewards for Sadaqa. I forgot the Arabic part of it. Forgive me for that. If you give Sadaqa, there are 10 rewards. Walilqarde, Tamani Ashara. When you give Qard, loan to someone, there's 18 rewards. And when you connect ties, when you do Sila Rahim, there are 30 rewards. All these, these years, we thought Sadaqah was the most important thing. Allah says, for that, only 10 rewards. Why? Because you don't know who's the recipient of the Sadaqah sometimes. We take out Sadaqah. Every single day, there's a habit of taking out sadaqah when we're leaving the house for our safety. When this sadaqah goes somewhere, we don't know who's being the recipient of it. But it's still, God gives us tenfold reward for it. When you give loan to someone with the intention of this loan coming back to you, but because it is someone specific who's in need, there's 18 rewards for it, even though it will be returned back to you. But when you give it to someone who's your family member, Sulay Rahim, there's 30 rewards for it. That itself just highlights how important it is to keep the ties with the family members. Yes, if you fear that this family member might not have a positive influence on our children, that's another story. You don't have to continue knocking on the door of someone who's continuously boycotting you or does not want to see your face. 
God does not want you to humiliate yourself in front of someone. But this is where the other side is ready to embrace you, but you are neglecting. The other side is waiting for your call, but you continuously trying to ignore that person. Ayat of Quran says, وَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of you, in congregation, وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا And do not cause even smallest of dispute and discord amongst yourselves. وَاذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ عَادَانِ Remember the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala onto you when you were enemies of one another. إِذْ كُنْتُمْ عَادَانِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the time that you were enemies of one another, He bestowed His favor to unite you. فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانًا Thus, with the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you became what? You became brothers in faith. This is the translation of the surah. When it comes to our relations, when it comes to treating one another, obviously we are someone who learned the akhlaq from Ahlul Bayt. And when we learn the akhlaq from Ahlul Bayt, our akhlaq should be representative of how they want us to treat others. And when that happens, we sometimes see that our akhlaq are not at that level. When we meet others, when we greet others. It is possible that at times we might not be able to control our anger due to different reasons. But at all times, when you're trying to give someone nasiha, keep this in your mind, that that person might be in musibah themselves, and therefore this nasiha could backfire. If you can ask these children to be taken over there. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Too much. Cute little girls, but I can't concentrate. There's one more girl over here. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Come on. One more loud salat, please. Every ayat of Quran has a recipient. Ayat are for someone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses different people in Quran. Some places he addresses mu'mineen. Some places he addresses kuffar. Some, people he, some places he addresses you know, mushrikeen, different people are being addressed in Quran. So when we look at this particular ayah, We ask who is being addressed over here? Who is the recipient of this ayah? Because this ayah does not begin with, Ya ayyu ladhina amanu, Ya ayyu annaz, or Ya ayyu ladhina ya al kafirun, or anything like that. Who is the recipient of this ayah? Obviously, with the context of the ayah, we understand that it is addressing us. But still, nonetheless, you try to find out who is being addressed. If you look in the context of Revelation, it is mentioned that there were two groups of people who had embraced Islam in the time of Rasulullah. Two tribes, Aus and Khazraj. And they were at odds with one another. To the extent that the smallest of the conflicts would cause bloodshed. They would always brag about how strong one was from the other. To the extent that they would count the number of people in their family. You know, it wasn't about wealth, how much wealth you had. It was how many people you were in your household. That considered to be the uh, area of your strength. That if you were more in numbers, you were, you know, you had more strength. They didn't count, they didn't care how much wealth one possessed. To that extent that they one day decided that we'll count people in our own tribes to see who is superior from the other. So they started counting. And when they weren't satisfied with the counting, they said, obviously one group had more, one group had less. They said, let's go ahead and count even the deceased. So they visited the graveyards to go ahead and count their deceased. 
to just show superiority who has more people and who has less. Just imagine the mentality at that time which Prophet is sent into to go ahead and remove this lalalat or darkness from the society. So this reason, the ayat of Quran was revealed. Hatta zurtumul maqabir. Right? That there is so much that you got, were engulfed or encompassed with to go ahead and prove the richness of one another that you visited the graveyards to that extent that you were counting your disease. These people are dead. You're counting them to be part of your family now just so you, so you can show that we are more in number. So one thing, context of revelation, this surah, this ayat rather, was revealed for Aus and Khazraj because of their animosity towards one another. But every single ayat of Quran is not just for that particular time. It reflects upon us as well. So thus we find out, is it reflecting upon us as well? We look at the previous ayah. If this ayah does not give us the recipient, because every ayah of Quran has a mukhatab that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to. This ayah, if you refer to Ali Imran 102, it says what? It says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, ittaqu Allah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. O those who believe, fear Allah the way he deserves. And do not die, leave this world until you're submissive. Here we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to mu'mineen. One little point, if you can take this with you, is that how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has differentiated between mu'min and ghayr mu'min in Quran. Imagine today, again, we end up giving the example of presidents or kings or whatever. Let's just give example of marja taqlid. Because nobody's bigger than marja taqlid in the world for us. No president or no king. Imagine if Marja Taqlid was here and he addressed you with your name. How would you feel? It happened to me, in fact, I was visiting a center. There was a question and answer session. A child raised a question. I said, it's such a good question that I'll mention it from the member. He said, mention my name as well. So that people, he gets the credit that he was the one who raised this question. I would have just said a child raised this question. He said, no, mention my name. And that way he gets the credit and everybody says, mashallah, shabash. Unfortunately, that runs even when we get, when we get older. Imagine if Marja Taqlid was speaking and he said so-and-so. And he called you out by name. How would we feel? How would we, you know, amongst our peers, we'd be like, look, you know, Marja Taqlid knows me. He's calling me by my name. If you're attending a dinner in White House and the president called you by your name, amongst these people, how would you feel? You would feel important. And so when we feel important, when these people in the world call us by our name, just imagine when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you. How should you feel? How important of that feeling should be for you? Because he is the king of all the kings. And every place in Quran when he says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, he's speaking to you directly. And this point, take it with you, that he differentiates between mu'min and ghayr mu'min. Anywhere in Quran that Allah addresses ghayr mu'min, he says, O Prophet, tell them. Qul, ya ayyuhal kafirun. O Prophet, tell these kuffar. Qul, ya ayyuhalladheena hadu. O Prophet, tell these Jews, قُلْ so and so. Whenever it comes to speaking to ghayri mu'min, Allah says they're not even worthy of me speaking to them directly. But when it comes to mu'min, He says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O those who believe. You know, one of those ayat is the ayat of fasting in Surah Baqarah, I believe 183, in which the command of fast came. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ السِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَا لَكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Right? Indeed, fasting is one of the most difficult of the ibadat. There's no showing off when it comes to fasting. You might pray to show off. You might give sadaqah to show off. 
You might perform other acts of wajibat to show off. But when it comes to fasting, you're depriving yourself of food and drink. You're struggling over here. There's nothing to show off. Either you're fasting or you're not fasting. It's that difficult of an ibadat. Something difficult? When God wanted this to be mandatory for us, you know, you want to give your child, for example, some difficult task. For example, you want to tell him to go ahead and, I don't know, if, he's, if, he, if he has those skills, can you go to downtown, bring these things from, or go to Home Depot, bring all of these things, and then can you come and install all of these things? Or, I don't know, something difficult, whatever it is that you think is the most difficult thing to give as a task. You go ahead and build up some sort of muqaddama so that you don't lay that news directly. Better yet, another example. That, for example, if someone loses a loved one, for example, a friend of yours lost his father, you received the news. Now you have to give this news to your friend. You're speaking to your friend. Oh, by the way, your father died. You won't do that. You'll settle him down. It's a very heavy news. You'll make sure that this person is, you know, feeling right. Because this news could have devastating effect. So when all of those things are considered, then you say, oh, I just received the sad news. Your father died last night. You lay this news in a way so that it's not heavy on the heart of this person. Imam said this difficult ibadat, because it was difficult by nature, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made sure that we receive this news in a way that is not difficult for us. He said, this is an ibadat which was prescribed on people who live before you. It's nothing new. People have been doing it before you. And then our sixth imam said, the way لَذَّةٌ مَا فِي النِّدَاءِ The way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls upon us, it relieves all of the pressure and the difficulty of this ibadat. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. The muhabbat, the mercy that is filled in this kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it removes any type of difficulty if there was any in this difficult task. If I can ask you to move forward. Right here, come right here. Get up and move. Get up and then move. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. One more loud salawat, please. So here we understand that mukhatab is you and I. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Ittaqullah haqqa tuqatihi. Four things. When you believe in one God, you become muwahid. That means you believe in wahdaniyat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is one of the reasons where there's a difference of opinion amongst the fuqaha. A lot of time, you know, when you say something, things get taken out of context. And with everything going on YouTube these days, I fear the same. A scholar that had come here recently, he spoke about some topic in Florida and then it was taken out of context. Another scholar of ours said something back in 2010 in UK. Now his video is circulating all over because those views are now considered to be radical. That when you believe in one God, you become wahid. And that is the criteria, as far as our fuqaha are concerned, for the purity of mankind. So if a person is a believer of one God, wahdaniyat, therefore, Ahlul Kitab, Christians and Jews, Zoroastrians, they're all considered to be what? Pure. They're ritually pure. So if they cook something, prepare something, if they come across with wetness, it's, it's pak. But if yes, if a person is not a believer of one God, then there's this internal impurity, which according to some of our maraje, translates into their external impurity. So if you come across with them, wetness transfers this najasat. So muwahid is a person who believes in one God. 
But that's the first stage. Then you become Muslim. That means you become submissive. And you believe in the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Then you get to the third level. Where you become mu'min. Who is a mu'min? Alhamdulillah all of us are mu'mineen. Quran talks about mu'min. وَقَالَتِ الْإِعْرَابِ آمَنَّا Arab said, Amanna, we brought Iman. He said, Qul, lam tu'minu, walakin qulu aslamna. Tell them, you haven't brought Iman yet. Rather say, aslamna. We are submissive. So we understand over here, Iman is something, and Islam is something. He said, Lamma yadkhul al-Iman fi qulubikum. Iman has not entered in your hearts yet. So as long as it's on our tongues only, and it has not translated into our actions, then we are lacking iman. We can, as, at most, we can call ourselves to be Muslim, but we're not mu'min yet. But do you stop over there? Who's mu'min? The very next ayat after this says, innamal mu'minun. Mu'min is someone, alladhina amanu billahi wa rasulihi, Mu'min is only that person. In Nama comes to go ahead and bring this, give hasr. That means there's no one beyond this circle. Mu'min is only that person who believes in Allah, believes in God, and his messenger. Then comes the tricky part. Because there were so many people at that time in the time of Rasulullah, who believed in Allah and who believed in Rasulullah. Then comes the difficult one. He says, Thumma lam yartabu. And then this person does not have any doubt, none whatsoever, in what Allah says, in what Prophet says. There were many people, even the greatest of the companions, that when things were not going according to how they wanted, they started doubting Rasulullah. So for example, Rasulullah went to perform the pilgrimage. He was stopped on the boundary of Makkah to Mukarramah. He negotiates, you know, works out a peace treaty. He says, we'll come back next year. Right away, people started saying, I always doubted the Prophet. Now my doubt is complete. For sure, I have doubt in his Rasalat. So there were people right there. You and I sometimes fall into the same category, unfortunately. Because we say things from our tongue, but not necessarily act it out. If I was to ask over here, does everybody over here believe in Allah? Everybody will nod. Yes, of course we believe in Allah. What kind of question is this? Do you believe in the ayat of Quran which says, Alam ya'alam bi anna allaha yara? Do they not know that Allah is always watching over them? Say, yes, of course we believe in this ayat. Then why is it your actions are in disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That you go ahead and disobey Him every single day. That shows that you still have not 100% believe in God. Those who believe in God, those who believe in Rasul, then they have zero doubt, none whatsoever, as far as the ahkam are concerned. So that's the criteria for Iman. Inshallah, we are all on that criteria. But is that all we want to reach, or is there something further ahead? Last stage is muttaqi. So you're muwahid, you're Muslim, you're mu'min, then you're what? Muttaqi. We should always continue to pursue upwards so we can get to this level of taqwa. There's been many discussions about taqwa, so I'm not going to waste your time talking about it. I have other things to discuss pertaining to this particular ayah, and there's a message to give. But just to explain to youngsters as to what taqwa means, there are different translations you find. One translation of taqwa is piety. One translation of taqwa is God-weariness. Right? 
Another translation of taqwa, for example, would be fear Allah, fearing God. Different translations have been given. Taqwa is best of the provisions, and so on and so forth. When our sixth Imam, Imam Jafar al Sadiq was asked, and tafsir al taqwa, he said one sentence. He said, An tata'allam or an ta'alam bima jahilta wa ta'amal bima alimta. That's it. He said, Taqwa is learn that you do not know and act on what you already know. That's what Taqwa is. One sentence. I'll let you ponder over it. Sleep over it tonight. Imam is saying what? He said, act on that you already know and learn that you do not know. Another place when it was asked, and tafsir taqwa he said, An la yafqadaka Allahu haythu amaraka wa la yaraka haythu nahaka. That you should not be present at the place where God has forbid you to be. That's taqwa. And you should definitely be seen at that place where God has ordered you to be at. We should not be seen at a place where God does not permit us to be at. If it's in our control. That's what taqwa is. Sleep over it. Think about it. These are the two rawayat. That's all Imam said. Not any lengthy discussion or anything of that matter. How many times it has happened that we ended up being in places where we shouldn't have been. We had choice, but we still went ahead with it. I'm not local here, so I'll say things and I'll leave after a week. You guys, you guys can keep talking about it and whoever the leaders of the community are, they can keep answering your questions. Who did you invite? That there's so many occasions that come about in our lives. We just forget. There's God, there's Prophet, there's Masoom, there's Sharia, there's Deen. Maulana, it's a big day for my child. It's a big day for my daughter. She's getting married. So that one day we'll forget about all the Deen. Everything that is against the law, we'll go ahead and do it. Because it's just one day. What is one day going to do? Then we'll go back. The worst thing is the program begins with the tilawat of Quran, with the recitation of Hadith Kisa, and then you know what the rest is. If you're in such a place, you're not acting according to taqwa. This is the place where Imam is saying what? An la yafqadakullahu haythu amaraka wa la yaraka haythu nahaka. Take a stand. Someone has to. He said, I keep on mentioning Ayatollah Karati and his uh, words of wisdom. He said, do, everyone will be in agreement except 15. He said, who cares about 15? The whole world is with you. Those 15 is one Allah and 14 Masum. They are in disagreement of what you're doing, but everyone else agrees with you. The whole crowd over here agrees with you what you're doing, but Masumin disapprove. So what? We gotta be mindful. All of these things reflect. Yes, it's a big day for your daughter. You know, a lot of time, and I'll give you an example of my community. We ask when we we're invited to recite the nikah, because nikah usually is done in the masjid, in Imam Barga, and then the next day they have the reception. Molana, we would like you to come to the reception. So I asked them, really, do you want me to come? <laughs> then the guy thinks over. Well, you know, so I asked him, is it going to be mixed gathering? Yes, it's going to be mixed. Is there going to be any music? Yes, there's going to be some music. And then says, so better off that I don't come. It's your choice, Molana, but we would really love for you to come. I said, if I'll come, you'll have to turn off the music. You'll have to make them sit separately. It can be mixed. Then you can stay home. 
I'm just Pesh Imam, leader of their namaz. There is Ghaib Imam. I tell people that when you invite, write first letter to Imam of your time, inviting him to your gathering. Write the first card to Imam Zamana, that Imam, we invite you to our child's gathering, child's wedding, for example. When you can't even invite Pesh Imam, how are you going to be able to invite Imam of your time? Sallallahu Muhammad wa Muhammad. When I say, you know, there are so many other topics, there's so many other problems worldwide that we're facing. Why is he talking about these things? We would be questioned about every single one of these things. You know that ayat very well. Every atom worth of good deed will be presented to you. Every atom worth of evil will be presented to you. In fact, the funny thing is, television, how old is this invention or creation? 150 years, maybe, right? Not even? 100, 100, let's just say 100 years. My ignorance, so I don't know, but let's just say 100 years for the sake of argument. Television did not exist, exist before 100 years. Or the cameras or movies and whatnot, making the movies, right? Mufassireen and our tafasir are date back to 1300 years, 1200 years, 1000 years, 500 years, right? Many tafasir, such great tafasir that we have. Tafsir Namuna is written by Ayatullah Makarim Shirazi, who's our contemporary. Tafsir Al Mizan, written by Allah Mattawa Tabai. Very beautiful tafsir. Tafsir Safi by Mullah Faid Kashani, 300 years ago. And many such tafasir. People, so Allah Mattawa Tabai and Tafsir Namuna, Sahib Tafsir Namuna, Allah Ayatullah Nasir Makarim, they knew how to do the tafsir of this ayah. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرٍ يَرَى but the ulama of 200, 300 years before, they had no idea how to translate or to do the tafsir. Why? Allah is saying every atom worth of good deed will be shown to you. They had no idea of showing. How will it be shown? Because there's no concept of recording. There's no concept of presenting. There was no concept back then. So they had difficult time translating and doing the tafsir of this ayah. But now it's very easy for the Mufassireen. Why? Because they know with these technologies that we have, every single thing that we do will be presented to us in front of, I don't know, what, how many inch of a screen, with which technology, HD technology, clear cut so that you don't miss any camera angle. It'll be presented how you did it and what you did. There is no way of farar. There's no way of running away. That, oh, no, I didn't do it. A lot of time... We mix good with bad. You know what's the wrong problem with that is? When you mix good with bad, every time you do something good, you store it in your bag of good deeds. But as soon as you commit something wrong, there becomes a hole underneath this bag of yours, and that good deed falls out of it. On the Day of Judgment, when we bring this bag of good deeds, thinking it's heavy and it's got good deeds in it, but we'll look into it, it'll be empty. Why? Because every time we did something wrong, that thing just slipped right out of there. So com combining good and bad. You know, there was a person in the time of our sixth Imam, Imam Jafar Sadiq, alayhi salatu wa salam. Muhammad one. Someone said, this guy is very generous. He helps the poor and the needy. Imam followed him one day. Imam saw that he went to, you know, a bakery, noon Wai at that time, right? And he was speaking to the owner. When the owner was busy, he picked up a couple of breads and he hid in his libas. And he said, this guy's generous. Imam followed him. I'm sure you've heard of it, just for the kids, so that they know what the story is about. Imam followed him. He went to a place, a guy was selling fruits. He spoke to him for a while. As soon as his attention was diverted, he picked up a few fruits, put it, in, put it in his pocket. And then he went forward. Imam saw that he went to a poor guy. He gave him one, you know, naan, one bread. 
he went to another needy person and he gave him the fruit. Imam stopped him and he said, what did you just do? Not recognizing Imam, he said, have you not read Quran? Imam said, yes, I have some knowledge of Quran. He said, have you not read that ayat of Quran which says, فَمَنْ جَعَى بِالْحَسَنَةِ فَلَهُ عَشْرَ Amthaliha, right? The one who comes with good deed, their tenfold reward for him. وَمَنْ جَعَى بِالسَّيَّةِ And the one who comes with a bad deed, simple, same compensation, one compensation for that. So I did two good deeds, that's 20 rewards. I did two wrong, minus that, I still gained 18. That was the math that this person was doing. Imam said, have you not read another ayat of Quran? إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Allah accepts the action of those who are muttaqeen. And a muttaqi will never go ahead and steal anything from anyone. Islam is on haq. You can't come through right to battle if you want to get to Islam. Don't use falsehood to come to the truth. So sometimes that's what happens. We mix good deeds with bad deeds. And then when the time comes, we're struggling to find what happened to all of those good deeds. I'll try and wrap up and come to the discussion that I originally had. That's why I like to keep notes in front of me so I don't get into these tangents. But nonetheless, we see that this ayat is very important as far as the unity is concerned. Dealing with others, speaking to someone. It says, تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ Adopt the akhlaq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How did our masumin speak to other people? How did they treat, to pe treat other people? Ayat of Quran says, وَأَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Don't say anything which causes dispute and disunity. وَاذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ Remember the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala onto you. Twice in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the word favor. We're told to adopt the akhlaq of Allah. In this ayah, the akhlaq of Allah is what? That twice, and I'm going to use this word with your permission, is bragging, na'udhu billah, that God is bragging about his favors onto mankind. Remember, with my favors this happened to you? With my favors this happened to you. Oh Allah, at one point you're telling us, لا تبتلوا صدقاتكم بالمن والأذى Do not cancel or void your good deeds by mentioning and reproach and bragging. It says, قول معروف خير من صدقة يتبعها أضا قول معروف ومغفرة A good kalam, speaking to someone nicely. And forgiveness is better than giving someone sadaqah while keep on mentioning it over and over and over again. There's a concept of habt and takfir in kalam islami. That an action that you do, habt means it's voided, it's canceled after you have performed that action. So for example, you did something good, you reminded that person of that good deed, guess what? It's gone. You helped someone out a week ago. Someone needed money, you lend them the money. A month later, you reminded them, remember I helped you out? Guess what? That good deed is gone. That good deed, kiss that goodbye. And then there's concept of takfir. Not the takfir that is happening in the world today. Takfiriyat, making people kafir. No, not that takfir. Takfiriyat of takfir comes from kafara. That you do an action which is incomplete. But later on you do an action which completes it. So you fasted but you broke it. You give kafara, you get the reward for it. You look at the rahmat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he says to the angels, kiram and katibin, right? Raqib and atid, who are sitting, counting and writing down good and bad deeds. Allah says to the one who's writing the bad deeds, he said, if my servant commits a sin, wait for some time. Rivayat mentioned eight hours, 10 hours. Maybe he might f ask for forgiveness. Maybe he'll do tawbah. If he does perform tawbah, don't write this at all. Don't document this evil deed. Don't document this sin. Don't document this mistake. 
That's the rahmat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ma sallallahu. And then he tells the other angel that if my servant thinks about doing a good deed, document it right away, even if he doesn't perform it. He just thought of doing something good, write it down. May, he might forget later on and he might not do it, but write it down as soon as possible. That's the rahmat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when it comes to good deeds, even if we think about doing something good. Now don't take this as, okay, I'll just think about good deeds all day long. And Allah will start writing it. No, it's just an incentive which is given to you. That man sabaqat rahmatuhu ghazabah. The one whose rahmat exceeds his ghazab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is. So ni'mat is something which is being mentioned twice. But when we do a favor to someone, don't reproach, don't brag. Put it in the vault, throw it away. Urdu mein kehte hain, neki kar, dariya mein dal. Do good deed and then just forget about it. Don't bring it up on your tongue again. Because if you do, you won't get any reward for that. Another concept which is being mentioned, I'll come back to ni'mat, inshallah. Because I want to make sure that the whole ayat is translated and explained. It says, وَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ Rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the rope? We need to cling, hold on to this rope. We need to hold on to it tightly. So that we don't lose out. You know, there's a, obviously a story made up, but with, which reflects on the reality of the estate of Muslimin. That in Qiyamat, there were three wells. One was for Christians, one was for Jews, and one was for Muslims. There were guards guarding the well of Mus uh, Christians, as well as the well that belonged to the Jews. So there were Jews in that well, there were Christians in the other well, and there were Muslims in the third well. And onlooker asked, how come those two wells are being guarded, the third one isn't? And he said, well, Jews and Christians, they help each other out, their brethren, and they want to come out of this well of darkness. So we need to have a guard to push them down again. He said, how come you don't have one on the Muslim well? He said, well, if one Muslim helps the third, second one, third one pulls his leg. We don't need to have guards over there. They are dooming themselves. They're doing it to themselves. And that's the sorry state, unfortunately, sometimes. And that's why habl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very important. Habl is multiple things. Ahlul Bayt is part of this rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more strings this rope has, the stronger this rope would be. This deen is the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your good deeds are the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your akhlaq. Someone said, what is deen? Can you translate deen for me? A lot of time when you put someone at the spot, it's very difficult for them to, even if they know. Deen is three A's. If someone asks you, what is deen? You say triple A. A, A, A. What is A, A, A? First A is ahkam, the thing that you must perform. Second A is aqaid, your beliefs. Third A is akhlaq. You have these three A's, you have deen. But if you have first two and you don't have the third one, that ahkam and that, ah that aqaid has no value if it's, it's lacking any akhlaq. So deen is the name of three A's. So add on to this rope so the string is stronger. The stronger the string, the stronger connection you will have. One of the scholars, um, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Ansari, alayh, whose book is still taught in Hawzatul Ilmiya today. Anyone who goes higher as far as the Hawza Ilmiya is concerned reads his book before he can get to the level of ishtihad. He wrote a book, and he was marja taqlid of his time. Someone in his time saw a dream. And in his dream, he saw um, shaitan, and shaitan had all of these different types of ropes. And so he was asking shaitan, why do you have all these ropes? He said, I use these ropes to throw towards people and pull them towards myself. 
So he saw different sizes of ropes. He said, yeah, because some people are easy to pull, some people are difficult. He said, I saw the biggest and the strongest of the ropes over there. I said, Wh whose is this for? He said, this is for Sheikh Ansari. In fact, I tried using it on him last night, but you see, it broke. He said, really? He said, which one of these ropes do you have for me? He said, I don't need rope for you. I just point towards you, and you come running towards me. <laughs> he said, I woke up from that dream, went to see Sheikh Ansari. I said, I saw such a dream. Shaitan had a rope for you, but it was broken. What happened? He said, yeah, last night I was in need of some money. And I had in Baitul Mal, Wujuhat, Khums, with me. I could have used it and then later on put some money back in it. And I was tempted to go ahead and use it for that genuine reason that I had. He said, but I refrain from touching that money because that money belongs to Muslimin. Shaitan tried to tempt me to go ahead and use that money. I refrained. I think that was the cause. That rope broke. So here we understand that we should also be amongst those for whom shaitan has to struggle to deviate from the path. That's why Quran says, وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ shaitan." Do not follow the footsteps of shaitan. It did not say don't follow shaitan. There's a difference. Don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. Shaitan works gradually. He's got all the time in the world. He sits right outside of your Imam Barga. He doesn't have to sit outside of bars or places of lahab and lao. He sits right outside of the masjid. To, if someone is entering into the masjid, try and stop them. Why are you coming here? When they're exiting, try to mislead them. Don't come back here again. Make sure that you have that deterrence towards shaitan. Do not follow the footsteps of shaitan. So he works gradually. Coming back to the concept of ni'mat. When do you do ni'mat? When do you do thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Whenever he bestows you with a ni'mat. We look at two sacrifices. One is the sacrifice of Hazrat Ismail. That when Hazrat Ibrahim saw that dream and he said, I want to, I saw that I'm sacrificing you. He said, go ahead and do it. If al matumar satajiduna inshallah minas sabirin. You will find me amongst those who are patient. Go ahead and do. Hazrat Ismail looked at that. When do you do sabr? When does someone tell you to have sabr? Has anyone ever told you to have sabr? When there's a calamity that falls upon you, right? When there's a musibat, you lose someone, it's a musibat. You lose a job, it's a musibat. You lose a friend, it's a musibat. Accident happens, it's a musibat. What does your friend tell you? Have patience. May Allah give you sabr. You lose a family member, someone dies in your family, they come and tell you, have sabr. May Allah give you sabr. Sabr jazil, sabr azim, whatever. Sabr is done in front of musibat. Understood. Hazrat Ismail, when he was presented with the idea that I'm going to be sacrificing you, he considers this sacrifice to be what? Musibat. That's why he's saying, I will be amongst those who are sabirin. That musibat which did not even take place, Allah lifted him, removed him, placed him with an animal. That dhib, that slaughter which did not even take place, Hazrat Ismail was considering that to be a musibat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he said, I want, I will be amongst those who are sabir. But comes the night of Ashur. Imam is with his companions. He recites this khutbah. He said, Allahumma inni ahmaduka an akramtana bin nubuwa. Oh Allah, we thank you and praise you that you bestowed us with Nubuwat. You gave us the ability to ponder in your religion. You taught us Quran. And you created for us what? Eyes, ears, 
and this heart. Faj'alna min ash Oh Allah, count us amongst those who are shakir, thankful, grateful. My question to you, when are you thankful? When do you say thank you to someone? When someone does a favor to you. When someone has presented you with a gift, when a ni'mat comes your way, you say what? Thank you. Shukran. Imam is saying, that Allah consider us amongst those who are shakir. Allahu Akbar. Imam knows that everybody will be martyred tomorrow, but he does not consider that to be a musibat. He considered that shahada to be a ni'mat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus he says, فَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الشَّاكِرِينَ not a musibat. We're not doing sabr over here. We're being thankful to you, O Allah, for having given us this opportunity that we are martyrs. That's the difference between the two shahadat or the two dhibh azim that you want to call. This one does take place, though. Imam is sitting with his companions. This is the way it was. Night of Ashur. The room is dark. Imam puts out the light. He says, you can go ahead and leave. They are after me, not after you. If you want, I lift my hujjat upon you. You're free to walk. It is easy for Imam to say this to those people who might have just joined Imam on the way. But does it make sense for Imam to say this to someone whom Imam wrote a letter asking him to come and join? I'm referring towards Habib ibn Mudahir. Imam, when he arrived in Karbala, he wrote a letter to Habib. Habib is in Kufa. Imam's child friend, childhood friend. Habib really knows Imam. Why? Because he walked on the footsteps of Imam. You know, when we make this dua, Allah give us the ability to walk on the footsteps. Habib literally walked on the footsteps of Imam from the very childhood. Wherever Hussein would go, Habib would be following Hussein as a young child. That's how they grew up. So that is the reason Imam writes a letter to Habib. And you know what he says? This is just enough for the status of Habib. Imam says, Min Hussein ibn Ali ila rajul al Habib ibn Mazahir. From Hussein to a scholar, Rajul al Faqih, Habib ibn Mazahir. Imam says in this letter, Oh Habib, you know our relationship to Rasulullah. Who knows better than you? You were there from the very beginning. We are in a bit of a problem. We are in Karbala. We are facing a calamity. And it would be nice if you can join us and help us. This is the word, these are the words that I paraphrased of Imam. Imam sends this letter to Habib. Habib, who in a way was expecting this. Someone knocks on the door. He takes the payam. And he reads it. When he reads, he was sitting with his family and they were enjoying a meal. And after he read, his wife asked, who is it from? Habib replied, it's from my friend Hussein ibn Ali. <laughs> Habib's wife said, from our Mawla Hussein? You and I write Arida to Imam of our time every 15th of Shaban. Imagine one day you receive a letter from Imam. How would you feel that day? Habib receives a letter from Imam. But what kind of letter is this? Where Imam is saying we are in problem and we need your help. Come and join us. Habib recites this letter. Wife says, what does he say? He reads out the letter. And then he's thinking. He's in a deep thought. The wife says, what are you thinking? He said, I'm thinking, should I go or should I not? When he said that, his wife got up. Ghayrat of the wife, she said, you're pondering 
whether to go or not when Hussein, son of Fatima to Zahra, is calling upon you? Fine, if you don't want to go, I'll go. Have you said, no, that is not the reason. I'm thinking if I go, I won't be able to come back. You will become a widow. She said, you're worried about your wife becoming a widow and you don't think about the wife of Hussein? She said, you know, if I go, my children will become yatim. Once again, she said, you're worried about your children becoming yatim and you're forgetting the grandsons of Ali and Batul and grandchildren of Rasulullah. Habib was just testing his wife. He knew what he had to do. There weren't many people who turned down the offer of Imam Hussein. There were people. Ubaidullah ibn Hurra Juhfi. Imam asked him to come and join. He said, no, I'm not with you, nor am I with Am Amr Asad. You can have my weapons. Imam said, I don't need your weapons. I'm trying to guide you from Zulamat ila Nur. Nonetheless, Habib, when he sees that his wife's Iman is as strong as his, he makes his move. He tells his servant, because he couldn't just get up and leave in Kufa. People were looking out for such individuals. Habib said to his ghulam, go wait for me outside the city at that point, and I will come and join you. You've heard this story many times. Habib then finally starts to move, but it takes a while for him to find his way out of the city because there were so many people looking out. It's very difficult for him. When he arrived at that place where he had told his servant to wait with the horse, he sees that his servant is speaking with the horse. There's this conversation going on, and both of them, as if they are crying and they're weeping, their tears running down the eyes of the ghulam. As if he's saying to the horse that if my master doesn't come, don't worry, I will go and accompany you to go ahead and help Mawla Hussain. Ajrukum Allah. Habib hears these words. He makes it to Ghulam and he says, I'm here. Now I've set you free. You're free to go wherever you want to. You have served me all well. Now I set you free. You know what Ghulam said? He said, all this life, when you needed me, you kept me with yourself. Now my Mawla needs me. You're letting me go. Let me have this opportunity to serve Imam Hussein as well. Habib says, fine. They go towards Imam Hussein, and they're riding towards Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein feels the letter that he had written. Imam understands the response of that letter, and he's waiting impatiently for that friend of his. He has given the alam to every single person, the standard and the flags to every single person. But there's this one flag which is just sitting there. People say, oh, Imam, who are you waiting for? This flag, you should have given it to someone. Imam said, no, the bearer of this flag is yet to come. And then Imam says, go ahead and get up. My friend is arriving. He sees from far distance someone was coming. He said, who is it that's coming? Imam said, this is my childhood friend. Friend Habib, he is about to come, and this flag belongs to Habib. As soon as Habib arrives into the camps of Imam Hussein, this was in a, in a way a joyful news for everyone. Everybody had smiles on their faces, as if everybody forgot about the musibah that is upon us. Everybody forgot about the thirty thousand of Yazid's army who are about to kill. This is the joy that that Habib had brought. He comes and he greets Imam and he hugs Imam. He kisses the hands of Imam and he throws himself onto the floor to touch the feet of Imam. Imam helps him up. He said, oh Habib, you responded to our call. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also respond to your call. And then when this news that someone has arrived reaches the tents of the ladies, Zainab says to Fizza, oh Fizza, can you find out from the morning? 
morning, this qafla has been coming. The enemy had been coming. What is going on? Why are they so joyful? Fidda goes out and brings the news that Habib ibn Mazahir has come. The childhood friend of Hussein is finally here. As soon as Zainab hears that, she says, Oh Fidda, convey my salam to Habib and tell him thank you for joining Hussein. Fidda comes out. He comes to Habib. She said, Oh Habib, Zainab has salutations and salutations to you. Zainab has conveyed salam to you and she thanks you for coming. Habib throws himself onto the ground. He picks up the sand and he puts it into his head. He says, what has happened to the time that Shahzadi Zainab has to convey salam to her ghulam? Ajrukum Allah, Ajrukum Allah. May Allah give you no grief and no sorrow except the grief of Ahl Bayt. Couple more sentences, Habib. Then it was the time for him to present his shahada. There was a time, Habib, went into the battlefield and he was martyred. But can you hear this one? Can you understand and comprehend of the musibat of Zainul Abidin? That when the kafila traveled from Karbala to Kufa, Habib's son heard that the kafila is coming to Kufa. He went out to look if his father was amongst the captive. He was asking people. He saw a head which resembled his father. He tried to snatch the head and he fought that man who was holding holding the head of his father because he did not want them to carry the head but the musibat of Zainul Abedin he sees the head of his father above on the spear but he can't do anything ala lanatullah alqawm alzalimin wa sayalamu allazina zalamu ayya man qalibin yanqalibun inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un Oh Allah, please accept our ibadah tonight. Oh Allah, we have committed a lot of sins. Please forgive our sins. Oh Allah, treat us with your mercy on the day of judgment and not with your adl. Oh Allah, give us the ability to follow the footsteps of Masumin alayhi wa salatu wa salam. Oh Allah, hasten the zuhur of our awaited imam. Make us amongst the helpers and the soldiers of imam. Wa akhru da'wana. Alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Ma'atam